You're listening to music tectonics. How to start up. 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 Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music, tech, and innovation. I'm your host. I'm one of your hosts, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors. And and I'm the other host who can't wait to jump in and say I'm Trister New Year Jaeger. And I am the chief strategy officer at Rock, Paper, Scissors. Yeah, we do a lot of PR and marketing for a wide variety of music, tech, and music innovation companies. And we've covered some amazing topics on this How to Startup series at Music Tectonics, from getting your mindset right to how to think about investment. And I truly hope that there are 100 company founders out there listening to this podcast and building alongside this series. That was our goal. Our conversations are meant to help you make great decisions and try things out that get you further along in your music tech journey. But Trista and I realized that we work so hard not to self-promote our PR and marketing company, Rock, Paper, Scissors, that we've left out the topic of how to PR. So we thought today we would have Trista interview me to help you get ready for that aspect of your work. And even if you're not ready to launch your first press release right now, there are a lot of things you can do to prepare. So take some notes and think about how you could build up to your first big news announcement. Um, and, you know, if it's a couple months away, if it's a year away, it doesn't matter. You can start having that little corner of your mindset ready to PR. Okay, so this is really fun to interview Yikes. you, Dimitri, especially because you're the one who dragged me into this whole PR game anyway and kind of taught me everything I know, um, at least in the beginning. And now the now you, you know, teach me what I know. I like <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So first off, let's talk a little bit about PR itself as a thing. Um, there seem to be a lot of different perceptions about the role of the media today. And in some ways, you know, there's there's some people who might even say, Is this even a thing anymore? Why should I worry about this? Um, What is the relevance of PR and the press these days for startups? Well, it is interesting to look at the media landscape because it has changed quite a lot in the last 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 years. I mean, it's always changing. But Mm -hmm. it is tricky now because we live so much in this digital world and people do not hold very many paper magazines or newspapers as a way to get their information, their news. Um, And in fact, just not that long ago, I noticed on a forum online, a a traditional music PR uh, expert saying, hey, what's going on with press? Is anyone else seeing a drop in press? And I'm like, yeah, for like the last five, 10 years um, yeah. for the artist facing or the or the fan facing stuff, there isn't a lot of press being written about music. It's not quite the same with companies or with ideas. Um, there's still content out there um, in terms of journalism and, and media that's writing about these things. You certainly have the, the trade press, the business press, the tech press, and then you have some relevant things to the, the wider consumer slash lifestyle world as well. And so you have this situation where a lot of people are gathering information through video or through digital platforms, social media platforms, and so forth. And it starts to feel like, well, I'm getting my content from peers or from people all over the world or whatever. What, you know, I'm not getting my content from, quote, the press. There is something unique about having a third party, an expert, talk about your company or your product or your service. It can literally be transformative to get that kind of validation. And if you look at that type of content, yes, you might be reading it on social media, but oftentimes it does start with an expert, a journalist, a writer, or an influencer of some sort that's creating content. It could be written content or articles. It could be video as well. But a lot of interesting news stories break through somebody writing about it as a professional who writes professionally, and then it gets shared socially. It creates word of mouth in the old way where somebody's literally like, hey, did you see that New York Times article? Did you see that Wired article? But oftentimes it's somebody posts it in social media or is talking about it in video form as well. So somebody has to write the content where all this stuff starts. There's still a role for that to play. And there's... um, there, there's, you know, hard questions that somebody needs to ask and, and the work to do the reporting on, on what's going on. So there is, I, I think definitely media has shifted in certain industries or certain music, even certain music products, it's harder to get press for. There isn't as much um, 
income for media that writes mm-hmm. about music, for example. And so it switched from, it switched from, I don't know what the exact order was. It switched from magazines to radio to blogs to uh, playlist pitching and now influencer pitching and so forth for like songs or something like that. But, um, but with companies like the ones that run around in the music tectonics network, there's still a lot of opportunities for professional writers to interview you, to talk about what you do, to help share announcements and so forth. And I do have to say, if you haven't experienced it, there is a psychological benefit to having your work in the public record, right? Like, sure, maybe somebody posted a a video that lasted for a few minutes about some consumer product that blew up at some moment, but then was out of business later. But having that sort of written record um, can really have a positive impact on you as a founder, as well as in the conversations that you have in in the future. So in terms of the relevance of PR and press these days, there's still opportunities. They have changed and they don't work for everything, but they certainly work for music tech companies. And it can really give you the confidence to go to the next level with the business deals that you're doing. Will I see you at the Music Tectonics Conference? Time is running out to get your conference ticket at a special price for early birds. That ticket gets you three days of connecting with the 500 music innovators you need to meet, all having conversations like the ones you hear on this podcast. On October 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, 2024, you'll meet the music innovators at a music tech carnival, high energy panels with music tech's movers and shakers, demos of new AI tools, plus the new ways people are creating music at our new creator fair. Don't miss the keynote with legendary music industry analyst Mark Mulligan of Media Research. There's a startup event at Universal Music Group and tons of opportunities for networking and getting business done. And it all goes down by the beach in Santa Monica, California. Tickets are just $249 if you buy yours now. But after August 20th, the price goes up to $350. So get your ticket now at musictectonics.com. While you're there, check out our growing speaker roster to see who you'll meet at Music Tectonics. I think we need to take a minute here to define what PR even is, because sometimes when I'm talking to folks who are fairly new to marketing, PR, self-promotion, that kind of thing, it's really easy for them to see the sort of blur between paid advertisement and and, um, PR earned media. How do we, what's a good way to clear all this up and get a good framework for understanding exactly what PR is and how it falls into this greater world of marketing and promotion? Well, over the years, um, I've learned about, you know, a lot of different approaches to PR and what it means and so forth. But there's one that's been put out by another uh, PR person, not in the music industry, not in the music tech space, called the PESO model, she called it. And and so PESO is an acronym for paid, earned, shared and owned. And I think it's a really valuable way to differentiate PR from other types of marketing. Because really PR, for the most part, you could say falls under the umbrella of marketing. Some old school PR folks might say marketing falls under the umbrella of PR. But, um, <laughs> Listen, darling. <laughs> and uh, personally, I, I think I would prefer if it was ESIP rather than pe- PESO, just because then the earned would be first, which is a lot what we work on. But let me explain PESO model. The P stands for paid. That means anything that you pay for, like advertising, that could be banner ads, that could be, uh, it could be pay-per-click ads on, on Meta, on uh, Google ads, YouTube, TikTok, et-, et cetera. That's paid. The E stands for earned. Earned media means that somebody is writing about you basically on the merits of the interesting uh, points of your story, right? You've earned coverage because what you're doing is interesting. It's new, it's fresh, it's a development within the field, et cetera. S stands for shared. Think of that as social media. Whenever you take any kind of content and you share it on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, et cetera, that's shared media. And sometimes that's shared media can come from a variety of sources, which we can talk about. And then the O in peso is owned media. So if you post something on your own website, your own blog, your own video channel, 
a tattoo on your arm. That is owned media. <laughs> so you've got paid is ads, earned is press and, and you know, speaking opportunities and so forth that you're not paying for. Shared is social and owned is on your own channel. So, so the shared stuff frequently would either be owned or earned media that you are then sharing out as well. So I think it's helpful to think about PR from that model. You can also think of it as earned media. We love that expression because we're, yes, as a PR firm, we get paid a retainer, we get a fee. So you, you're paying technically, but we're then basically becoming a, um, an, an arm of your team to go reach out and, and convince the media that you merit a story and you earn that. So that's one aspect, Tristra. The other thing that I think is interesting to talk about is PR versus marketing. Because we get um, marketing documents that read a certain way, and then we get press releases where we create press releases or other types of news announcements that are written a different way. A lot of times you think of marketing as sort of targeting a potential consumer. You think of it as a sales pitch a little bit. You're trying to convince people of something. PR doesn't always have the same tone. Um, and so there's... We think of it as like, if you really hyped yourself up, then you're probably writing with a marketing tone. If you're really doing more of a narrative storytelling approach, something that somebody would like, oh, that's interesting, as opposed to, oh, you're trying to convince me of something. Oh, you're trying to sell me of something. Then that that tends to have more of a, a, a PR style with it as well. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point because journalists are bullshit detectors by yep. nature, at least really the good ones, the ones you want to who are at the best outlets. And so if you come to them with marketing copy, they're going to instantly tune you out. And so taking a slightly more um, narrative driven, grounded approach is really helpful. So is we're talking about are we just talking about getting a hit in the media? Like what exactly should we put under this PR umbrella? Yeah, I mean, uh, the media is something that we can get into specifically because there's a lot there. But before that, like in addition to say the music trade magazines, et cetera, or what other publications we can talk about, podcasts is another form of earned media. Like we're doing one right now. You can, you can, um, <laughs> who, who earned, who earned their way on here? <laughs> well, if it's your own pod, technically for us, this is own media, but if somebody were to own pitch day. us and get on our podcast, that would be earned media. Uh, does happen. And sometimes. some of these other formats that you're asking about are a little bit like you could also maybe pay to have an ad on a podcast as well. But so podcast mm -hmm. is another category in, in addition to whatever the press would be now. Conferences is another one. Um, as a PR firm, we're frequently helping clients pitch to be on conference panels, moderators, etc. And it could cross into other types of events too, um, that where, you know, there might be other opportunities. Awards would be another one. Sometimes awards are kind of a hybrid. You have to earn it, but you also have to pay a fee. Um, but yeah, it doesn't just have to be the written word um, as well. And you can do kind of, you can do earned media in terms of influencers too, but most influencers these days in terms of video, TikTok, YouTube, etc., you usually expect a fee. That's pretty much their entire business mm -hmm. model. Absolutely. So in this day and age, and we've talked a little bit about how complicated or um, uh, difficult it can be to secure press. Um, so what press is out there? What should what should startups be thinking about in terms of their press? Targets? Yeah, so there's the, the the music trades are great. You know, the billboards, music business worldwide, music ally, hype bot, digital music news, music connection. There's actually a lot more trades than most people realize, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And some of them are more specific than others. Some are regionally differentiated from others, et cetera. But that's a category that a lot of clients come to us and that's basically what they want. And it's that's what's going to move the needle for most B2B music tech companies that want to work with other music tech companies or with record labels or with publishers or with streaming services or with social media companies or gaming companies, et cetera. They want to be seen as a leader within the music industry. In addition, to the trades, there's a lot of business magazines that are interested and relevant to what's happening in the business side of music as well. So you've got your Forbes, your Inc., your Fast Company, um, your Fortune, your Wall Street Journal, and on and on. And some people overlap business with tech, but there's a lot of separate tech publications. Some of them are kind of like industry uh, rags, like TechCrunch, um, VentureBeat, things like that. And then some of them are more consumer facing. They could be gadget related. You've got Engadget, you've got The Verge. Um, and then there's sort of like hybrid business and tech as well there. I, I was going to mention things like Progressive Grocer. Oh. <laughs> I think we pitched them once. Did we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
that's it. I can't remember the client, but there was a reason to pitch progressive. Well, and there are other trade publications. That's a great point because, you know, like a lot Mm -hmm. of our clients work in music tech, but they also overlap with sports or they overlap with video or they overlap with um, gaming. Telephony, telecom. Yeah, absolutely. Or health. Don't you love that Health and wellness or mixed reality and spatial computing. Mm -hmm. And so there are other trade magazines for each of those. Another good trade um, uh, category that some of our clients are relevant for if they're pitching like ad agencies or brands Mm -hmm. are the ad trades, the ad weeks and the ad ages and the Marpex and and things like that as Digiday, the drum, things like that. So you've got the music trades, but then you've got these other trades that are relevant to some of our clients and to some of you that are listening out there. And then we also on occasion get to pitch consumer and lifestyle outlets, which is a very broad category. Some of them are very specific to specific types of lifestyles. There could be the more yoga, Mm -hmm. sports lifestyle stuff, and there could be more like the homemaking or fashion lifestyle stuff. There's just so many different categories. The consumer side could be the kind of gadget that could be literally like the the, the publications that write about things you could buy, that review things that you could buy, or just, just, just lifestyle. And you have news publications as well that wouldn't necessarily fit into the trade business or tech, but maybe the ideas, the ideas lifestyle. (laughs) There are people out there with ideas and still want to read and talk about it. But the point is like for each of our clients or, or whatever type of company you are out there in podcast land listening, you may have some publications that resonate for you specifically that are different than another, another music tech company that's out there. I love that. I think it's great for startups to think really broadly about where they might fit in and to kind of even outlets that may seem like a reach, not like a crazy reach, like we will be on the front page of, you know, this big old newspaper, but um, to really think creatively about all the different angles that they could use. And, you know, sometimes getting regional press is really, really powerful. I'm thinking of some clients that got regional TV or a really good article in um, a local business journal that made a big difference for them in their community, uh, especially with things like investors. Absolutely. I mean, we had one one musical instrument client that got a local TV that led kind of focused on the education angle that led the the whole company down another path and a new revenue stream of, um, of, you know, building up more business in the education side of the business, which is super cool. Yeah. So that success story suggests my next question, which is how can you tell if PR is working? Like say you get a bunch of press hits, what should you be looking for um, in your business? What kind of things can happen? Yeah, it's interesting because there's actually a wide variety. I think most people just assume that the main reason to get press is to generate new leads and to convert new customers. Mm-hmm. And that is true. Um, we definitely hear from clients where a certain press hit, they can literally link their sales success back to one particular article or a handful of articles. And they start to know like, oh, this... Every time we get reviewed by this publication, this product goes up in sales. We can actually assign a dollar value there. But I will say Mm -hmm. that's really just the tip of the iceberg. And that's not the thing that happens for everybody every time. Um, And with a lot of music tech companies, a lot of it's on the business side. Regardless of whether it's a business uh, B2B company or consumer facing company, word of mouth is the thing that I think clients notice the most. People mention to them, hey, I saw the article about you in such and such, or I saw you posted that article on social media, um, on LinkedIn. Um, and, And so it's just like, it's this, and it just kind of raises the energy level of all the conversations. And another aspect about that is kind of the credibility and legitimacy that you get as a result of this expert third party noted media brand talking about you or your company or your product. And so not only are they saying, hey, I saw this hat, you know, I saw that article. I know more about you now. But also they're, you know, they, they're like, oh, wow, you're really doing this. You, you know, this, this isn't mm-hmm. just something you work out of your basement to create, but people are talking about you. People are writing about you, that creates credibility, that creates third party kind of social validation, et cetera, and education, actually, in the sense that before you walk into your next meeting for a potential partnership or investment or hire or acquisition or something like that, people, they already know what you do. And so you're kind of further along those, those next conversations go that much further. 
So there's some other benefits, Trish. I don't want to just give you a whole laundry list, but you know, we've, we've thought about this a lot. We hear from clients about yes. what's working for them. Search engine optimization is still a thing. You still want to show up when people are searching for your product yeah. or service type. You don't not want to be on the first page and getting press hits in legitimate sp- articles, whether they're trades or business or tech or consumer publications, will definitely have a positive impact for you on SEO. SEO has always been about tracking link- links back to your website. So that's very helpful. And, and this is still true with the in, the in the era of AI search, because a lot of people who are messing around with the weights, right, and what it's going to what's going to crank up in a summary are, are looking at, OK, where are the legitimate outlets so the legitimate sources that have um, some kind I mean not, not always but um, there there's definitely an effort so getting uh, a press hit will make a difference even in the age of AI search absolutely there, there's any minute now we're gonna see tons of LinkedIn posts about GPT optimization instead of instead of SEO it's going to be called yeah. GBTO or something like that so that's that's gonna happen and, th- and that being said um, you know these articles give you a great thing to post on social media. I think some people struggle with like, what should I put on social media? How much should I promote my company? Or how can I sort of change the angle or change the perspective of what it is that I'm posting on social media? You get a press hit. It's a great opportunity to post on your on your LinkedIn or if you're consumer facing on your other socials, on your Instagrams, et cetera. Um, you know, a little, a little snapshot with a pull quote of something some publication is talking about you as well. So it's, it's great for not only getting word of mouth, but also creating word of mouth, you know, so that you can also generate some word of mouth thanks to some, some legitimacy out there. What can this, I mean, you know, all this stuff, what can it lead to beyond just um, these types of things, you know, if you're looking for investment, you're going to get some, not only some potential interest from outside parties, but also, um, uh, you know, when you walk into those conversations, you get that sense of legitimacy, like, oh, this is a legit business. People are talking about it. If you're looking for uh, potential acquisition, so you want somebody to buy your company, that's another opportunity as well. We've seen press play a role specifically in needling a larger company. And that larger mm-hmm. company after one op-ed would then buy your company as well. So there's some interesting things you can do with press around that as well. Yeah, press can really induce um, FOMO in somebody that you're, you kind of are, maybe you're competing with on some level, but they're much bigger and maybe you're hoping that they might acquire you. Um, we've seen that little move work really yeah. well. And, you know, I, I'd say a couple other things on this point before we move on. You're going to get some confidence from being covered in the press about talking about your own business. Sometimes a journalist will frame things in a way that actually you're like, oh, that's how people want to describe this. I've been using these other jargony words or whatever, but a journalist has kind of like filtered through and now given you some great talking points. And regardless of whether that's the case, just the fact that they're talking um, about you will help you walk into a meeting feeling like, okay, yeah, I'm not, you know, like you're still testing ideas sometimes and like getting that third party Mm -hmm. validation can help you internally, psychologically as well. It's especially important if you're doing something very, very new, um, that where, where the market maybe is still emerging or where it's not quite clear how the technology is going to fit into the existing industry or tech stack or whatever. If you, if you have someone kind of give you their view, um, it can be great things to pull on. Yeah. Or or you can also see like, wow, this person really, they covered it, they were positive, but maybe they missed this whole thing. We really need to work on bringing that out in our messaging. So it's always a great learning experience no matter what. We interrupt this podcast to bring you breaking news. Applications are now open for Music Tectonics Swimming with Narwhals startup pitch competition. Get your application in by August 12th, 2024 at musictectonics.com. That's also where you'll find eligibility requirements, a timeline for the competition, and an FAQ. When you apply to Swimming with Narwhals, you'll get a warm welcome into the Music Tectonics community of music innovators. And your project gets seen by our juries of investors and experts. You could be one of four finalists in the spotlight at the 2024 Music Tectonics Conference, October 22nd through 24th in Santa Monica, California. It's the place to be for music innovators, whether or not you reach the finals. We have a demo day on the Santa Monica Pier, panels and networking with everyone you need to meet from investors to labels, and a very special startup boot camp at the Universal Music Group offices. Apply at musictectonics.com. 
because sharks are mean. Unicorns aren't real, but narwhals, narwhals are awesome. So there's one last thing regarding sort of what the impact can be of press that is our measure. <laughs> this is going to sound a little crazy for all you... <laughs> Vanity metric for RPS. Yeah, yeah, for all you quantitative <laughs> folks, this is going to sound a little crazy. Our biggest measure of success is client happiness. And that may sound crazy, but clients have different needs. I just listed a bunch of stuff that can help you in, in PR, but, you know, so, some of them might not be relevant to you. So, you know, there's like almost like... It's almost like um, different different measures of how how important is SEO for you versus uh, leads mm-hmm. generation versus um, you know getting content to talk about versus the psychological impact on yourself or how, how you know what, how a meeting goes because you've been written up in, in music business worldwide or music ally, et cetera. And so the client happiness is the is the I think the biggest factor. And Trisha, as our chief strategy strategy officer, you're kind of on the front lines with this. Yeah, client happiness is a really fun measure. Um, And part of that is because uh, people are happy in different ways. Um, And the success can be measured in different ways. And it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So startups, if I can give you one piece of advice as you begin your PR journey, think carefully about what the number one thing you want to achieve. So um, the clients that do the best with an agency or on their own with their own in-house kind of efforts are the ones who keep, you know, keep focused on what the actual goal is. So think strategically, not just tactically like, oh, well, we're going to get the word out. We're going to do it right away. And we're going to get it to all these different outlets. Like that's, that's not a strategy. That's just like a random plan for, for what we call spraying and praying. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So the, the, the needs that you may have can really vary. So if we, we've had some really great, like super deep B2B clients that really only needed two or three really key hits um, in specific outlets, and that is what made the difference for them. I'm thinking of someone like Mogul, um, which is a uh, basically a royalty administration kind of streamlining platform that helps artists and their teams and and labels potentially find all of the money everywhere and bring it all together in one place. Um, and they also, I think, are building a service to help collect these royalties, which can be a very onerous and, and tedious process. Um, but then we've also had clients, you know, so they needed a, a really key set of things. And when those happened, it worked out, it worked wonderfully for them. Um, we've had other clients like Playtime Engineering. They're super, super fun. They make synth um, you know, full-blown synthesizers, but they are safety rated for young children. Um, and they were building their first sort of, I would say, an all-ages product. Um, and they really needed, so they had this great base, but they really needed help kind of um, getting more oomph behind a Kickstarter and then just spreading the word about this new product that was somewhat different from the kid-oriented stuff they'd done before. And so they were really looking for lifestyle press and for, you know, the sort of gadget reviews and um, fun recommendation, gift list kind of things. And we were able to get them that, and they just killed it with their... um, with their Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah. So that was pretty incredible and pretty pretty fun to see as a publicist. It's always so rewarding when somebody does really, really well and gets to where they want to go. And it's cool to see that there's this diverse set of needs and approaches as a result of those needs. And, and you know, being really, I like what you said, Trish, about sort of like being really clear about what your goals are, because that will impact what, and, and we can help you identify why would you do press mm-hmm. and, and PR and so forth, but then really like tracking those business goals to who you're trying to target. Because if you're a B2B company like Mogul, you're not going to be looking for the same types of press as a B2C company like Playtime Engineering and, and the MyTrax. So um, yeah, that's really important to to sort of line that up and, and go from goals to audiences to media targets to tactics. Um, and that's something we can help you with. And that you can not be afraid to sometimes, if you're really new to this game, you're not quite sure where you're going, start small, right? Think of it as your first round of press outreach could be a dress rehearsal where you get on some podcasts that are going to be fun to do. You're going to practice talking about what you're doing. You're going to get some good first hits, though sometimes the strategy is even with startups, like we want to go really big, really fast, and we need to just have a big, splashy launch. Um, and that's possible too, but you need to make sure you have all the pieces in place for that. So Dimitri, yeah. what do you need to have in place if you're going to start doing PR? What does a company need um, by the time they're either going to press play on their own PR plan or, as we hope they will, hire a wonderful outside PR firm? Yeah, there's a, there's a variety of things that you can have in place that will get you the best value for, for working with a PR firm. 
the first and most important one is have a product or service that's ready. Um, oh, we have been hired by pre <laughs> pre launch companies that are not planning to launch anytime soon, and it is more challenging. And I'll talk a little bit about things you can do in those situations. But the truth is, you're going to get the most value out of doing a press campaign if there's something to press about, and uh, and a product <laughs> or service in in the case of a music tech or music innovation company typically um, is important. Now, I say that some of you listening out there are not startups. Don't worry about this. Um, it's it's really more for when you, you you know when you're a startup, when you're a startup founder, you have a lot of ideas, you have a roadmap in mind. In your mind, you are further along than anyone else knows. You might be further along than you realize, or you might not be as far along as you, as you realize too. You're like, yeah. oh, we've got the first thing and the next thing's coming. But be prepared that the, the the roadmap for technical development always takes longer, as does the road to investment. And, and Dimitri, just to, just to speak to that point for a second, that means if you have a bunch of features and hires and all, and we'll get to like the whole list of things, you can stay quiet. And it's really hard to do as a founder. As you're so excited, but please hold it, keep it to yourself if you're even thinking about doing PR, because if you've got a bunch of that stuff already in your basket, um, you can dole it out carefully over time and always have something to talk about as opposed to just like announcing it randomly on LinkedIn and then you've lost your chance to get it out you know, for the press. make some press yeah. around it. Yeah, so speaking of which, you, it, it is great if you're going to do a PR effort, a retainer, a campaign, um, to have a variety of different types of news announcements that Trish was talking about. There's the launch... And sometimes people come to us and that's all they have. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we can get some press with that, but typically you need more than that. So what else What else would be great to have to build the momentum? New features after the launch, you may do uh, You may do a beta, you may come out of beta, you may do a 2.0, et cetera. There may just be like one little button that you've added to your dashboard or to your app or to your machine or whatever that all of a sudden is getting tons of traction. Maybe it opens doors in another vertical within music or maybe it's outside of music as well. Those new features are super great for announcements. Investment, a great excuse to make an announcement. There are some publications out there that love to report on that type of news. So um, we definitely encourage you to kind of like put these things together the way that Trish was talking about, like build momentum through this cadence of things. So just because you raise the money doesn't mean you have to announce it right away. You might want to actually have a product so that by the time you announce your investment, people have a call to action that actually will help your business. If you're buying companies or if you get sold, that's another news announcement. Um, but there's even small things like a new person that you hire that came from an interesting past. Maybe it's from a different field. Maybe it's from a same field, but they're a veteran or executive from, say, a major label or a streaming service or a social media or a gaming platform, things like that. If you hire somebody that's in a new region, you have the opportunity to, quote, open a new office. And that's another opportunity to reach out to the press. So they can start to see that not only do you have a strong presence in L.A., but now you have a Nashville office, too, which could open up new types of conversations. And then any types of events, whether you're organizing your own events or you're part of events, part of conferences or um, launches that are in person, things like that. That's another opportunity to, to make an announcement. So we've got... Make sure you've got a product or service. Make sure you've got a, a string of um, news announcements with a quite a quite quite a lot of variety as possible. There, another thing that's great to have is positions that you want to take. I mean, the types of things that you could uh, work with your PR person to do guest articles, op-eds. Um, it could be that you have a blog that you want to amplify. We've worked with clients who already have a content person in-house, but nobody's reading their blog. So we syndicate that blog out to another publication. Um, it could be on a one-time deal, or it could be where we literally syndicate it. We're like, hey, would you guys like to take a monthly article from this client that's writing all about this, that, or the other thing? But really, those we call all that kind of stuff like the thought leadership component of it, is how you establish yourself around certain concepts that then push your business um, or your service forward as well. So be prepared to have certain positions that not only you want to take, but that you're willing to talk about. We also have clients sometimes who have a strong feeling about something, but for political reasons or partner or stakeholder reasons, they can't actually say anything. Um, and that makes it challenging. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Be aware, be aware of those pitfalls before you start like, you know, Putting all your, I keep wanting to baskets. talk about baskets, but before you put your eggs in that basket, I don't know what's, what's, not, what's going on with me today. I'm in a baskety mood. 
<laughs> so another thing um, that you probably want to have in place is a, a budget. And what I mean, what I mean by that is, you mean you have to pay publicists? Yeah. What is this? <laughs> Typically, PR firms work on a retainer, and as a result, yes. you want to make sure that you already know that you're going to have cash in the bank at the beginning of each month when that invoice becomes due. That could be in the form of investment, um, which is great for a new story as well, but also great for keeping your PR firm alive and well. And then the other option is cash flow. If you're cash flow positive, that's a great. That, you know, that's that's a great source to to work with partners like a PR firm or other agencies and things like that, too. So just a reminder that even though you have a product or service and you have lots of news and you have lots of ideas and you want to be in the press and you like all the benefits that come from it, this is uh, this is a lot of work. It's a labor intensive thing. So just make sure you've got enough um, runway to help you get there. Another just last bit on this, Tristra, in terms of what to have in place before you hire a, a PR firm would be great if you have some visuals and branding. We actually have the ability to help with that. Some some firms don't, but we now have a network of folks we can work with too. We can help you with a landing page and a website. We can help you with um, logos and images and that sort of thing. But a lot of times people come to us with that ready, ready to go. That means we can just move more quickly with getting you press and so forth. It just makes you look legitimate. It gives us opportunities to run, uh, you know, pitch articles with some imagery and so forth. If you have a video demo, a sizzle reel, a teaser of some sort, one that really shows off like like the either the the value proposition of what you have to offer or even the um uh j- just not a very hypey version of a sizzle reel like if it's just like this thing is coming we can't really do much with that in terms of press <laughs> I, we need we need your monster truck uh announcement yeah, exactly. voice right there um and for the video it can be short it can be a minute it can and as long as it um, it's actually it's a wonderful opportunity, especially if you have a technically complicated product or a very innovative product that, again, people aren't very familiar with. It's an opportunity uh, opportunity to educate uh, folks like journalists who, though, you know, they they may report on AI, but this aspect of AI, for example, they may it may be a blank spot for them. And you've got a chance to fill that in. And that's a really, really cool opportunity. So using a video can really help with that, along with, um, you know, written descriptions and press releases and that kind of stuff. So we got a long list. There's a long list of to do's there, guys. Sorry about that. Um, But let's go back for a second to thought leadership Mm. and news. Like, where does this stuff come from? How should a very busy team who are all wearing five hats lay the groundwork for this? What can people do to start understanding their place in the broader conversation? Because it's easy to get in your bubble and think this is the best thing since sliced bread. Everyone will just want to cover it because it's so awesome. But uh, alas, we live in a world where there's lots of competing um, things for our attention. So what could people do to place themselves in the broader music industry conversation? Well, and this is something that we can definitely help with too. If you're if, if, after I answer this question, if you're still like, yeah, but what are you talking it's about? Definitely yeah. some, it's, de- it's definitely part of the process. We think in terms of crystallization being one of the phases of the work that we do with our clients, where we're helping you position yourself within the broader context of what's happening in, in the space you're in. And uh, and that can be helping to educate you about what's what we see going on out there. But a big factor there is also understanding your real differentiators. If there's other people in the market that you're operating in that do similar things or the same thing or overlapping things, really being clear about that. So part one is sort of like, do some horizon scanning. Pay attention to what's happening in the industry. Scan the news. See who else is out there. Who are the players? Who are the players you're going to be selling to? Who are the players you're going to be partnering with? And who are the players who you're up against from a competition perspective? And you you can't really say, oh, I've got this product for record labels or for publishers or for managers or for artists without really understanding what are those people talking about? What are the problems they're really solving as well? Um, one little plug here, we do something, Trish and I do something called the Rock Paper Scanner. It's a weekly news newsletter that helps you with some of that horizon scanning. We do a combination of sort of where is the industry revenue? Um, uh, what are what are kind of like the, the 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 top level big thinking things that are happening in the industry? And then what are some of the like interesting uh, flavor, you know, like what's happening with gaming? What's happening with Hollywood? What's happening with AI, et cetera? And then just sometimes uh, one of the things I love doing this with Trisha is because Trisha reads so much different media. Her horizon scanning goes way beyond the music industry or around, around tech. And so we get some other interesting articles in there. 
I was going to say it's my excuse to to read all about, you know, <laughs> nanotechnology and <laughs> internet memes. It's but it's great. all going to impact music at some <laughs> point, my best right? Life. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's all very related to music and in so some way. <laughs> you want to do enough horizon scanning that you get some of those big picture futuristic Tristra style stuff. And then you want to dig into the music industry details and, and the personalities and the and the needs and the, the problems that are being solved there. So start with horizon scanning. And then I, I mentioned understanding your differentiators. As you start to see like who else is in the market? Who are you competing with? Who do you overlap with? Because a lot of what's happening now is it used to feel like X company was competing with Y, but now it feels like ABC company is competing with C, D, E company in the sense like there's something that competes, mm -hmm. but in, in another way, they could be friendly partners or whatever too. But really understanding your differentiators, uh, you know, what makes you unique? What is your value proposition? And honestly, this is one of the fun psychological parts of PR too, is it could be really about your life mission work too. Like, what are you doing? What is yeah. your co contribution founder to the world? And how is it manifesting through the mission of the work you're doing as a company? And be more specific than I want to help artists or I'm going to help artists make a living. Right. Like how, why, what exactly? Um, is that, that, that the answer will be different for all sorts of different music companies. Exactly. So go yeah, deep. yeah. If you're going to if you're going to help artists, then what we actually want to know is I'm going to help artists by creating a direct to fan platform that's different for the following reason, and then have a really good reason mm -hmm. that's different. Um, or I'm going to help artists by being a marketing platform that does something that people do in ad tech, but it's never been done for music. And this is how we do it. And this is why it's cheaper, faster, better, more impactful, et cetera. That's the kind of differentiator we're talking about. And that may sound very specific and very in the weeds, but that is ultimately what journalists are going to want to know. Like, why should I cover you versus somebody else? Why is this new? Why is this different? Um, that's really where I think the, the, the fun business storytelling happens as well. This is all, this is really great. I feel like we've given people a big, big sort of chunk to uh, chew on and think about. Um, but I want to make sure we hit one really important thing, which, you know, we sort of began with talking about how the overlap between paid media and earned media and owned and pesos and espos and whatever. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, how should we think about like, how, does, how should marketing and PR play together? And like, what are some things that startups need to think about if they want to do both? Yeah, um, it's interesting that um, things have changed so much with media and PR that it starts to bleed together a little bit in a way. Um, I think for one thing, you can use some of that PR voice that we talked about that's different than the hypey marketing voice people are looking for more authenticity. And so start with just the type of storytelling that you're doing as well. So like, if you feel like you're looking at what other brands have done, that might not be the right approach to how to tell your story, not only through the press, but also through marketing direct to your potential user or customer and things like that. So one piece of it is to let your PR voice influence your marketing voice. And I know that's kind of like maybe higher level than what you were thinking I was going to say, Tristra, but... No, no, I think that's great because that... I, and to give a concrete example, we have a, an amazing client right now called Eternal Research. And we, um, I got the the opportunity to work with the founder, who's an incredible person, and write a bunch of her stories up and her perspective, and really help her focus on what she wanted to say. And that influenced how we executed the first tranche of marketing for the company, and it ended up being a distinctive, wildly idiosyncratic, like really beautiful um, statement that reflects this this company's ethos really well. So sometimes doing that deeper narrative work that's a little bit less like distilled, crazy, <laughs> dialed up to the max like marketing can get can help you have like a, a, a basis of truth, right, that you can always go back to and that and you can always make something crazier. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> but, you know what I'm it's saying? It's interesting what you're saying, Trista, because it's like when you think about marketing, you think about sort of like, how do I raise the energy level? How do I stand out in the in the masses by elevating, amplifying, you know, turning up mm -hmm. the volume? When you look at that sort of internal approach, it's really it's 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 really about like it goes back to that differentiator. It goes back to like what is my story, and really going back to the core of sort of like who am I and why am I unique as a business, as a founder, as a product, whatever, and then 
you talk about, okay, well, what's the right timbre for how we talk about this rather than just volume? It's more like timbre. It's more harmony, like to use some musical metaphors. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. You got to EQ the exactly. whole thing. Don't just turn That's it right. up. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's that kind of storytelling component of it. I would also say like, you know, we mentioned when you get press hits, you can then use them in marketing as well. When you get a press hit, there's a lot that you can do with it. You can put it on your website. You can put it in an email news newsletter. You can post it on your social media. Something people forget to do, which is super powerful. Put your latest press hits below your email signature. You know, put a quote and put mm -hmm. Billboard next to it, Music Business Worldwide next to it, New York Times next to it, what, whatever it is. And then, of course, you can also help generate word of mouth by just making sure people know about these articles that are coming out as well. Um, we talked a little bit about video before. Video can strengthen press. Don't rely on it solely, but there's a great way to, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of want to think of your storytelling as, a, as an accordion or um, um, something that starts small but then can expand out. So you have your tagline, you have your boilerplate, you have your about page, you have your press release, and then you have your video and you have your social media channels. All those things should sort of head in the same direction. So I think part of it with, with marketing is to make sure there's alignment across those. And sometimes, you know, having those folks um, work closely together can really align that message throughout all the different formats of, of mediums, as well as um, different moments in time. You know, if you're going to do a Kickstarter campaign, it makes sense to have press go along with it. Um, if you're mm -hmm. going to do an influencer campaign, you want to make sure that your press is aligned with the same type of story that you're telling through, through the influencers and vice versa. You can actually amplify influencer impact in press as well, um, if you're lucky enough to jump on some viral meme type of thing as well. This is really, really awesome. And by the way, everyone, um, I'm going to I'm going to set aside my usual Midwestern um, humility and say you can hire us for both. That's the great thing is you could have one team that works together with you um, and gets both of these things uh, going in parallel and, on, and in deep conversation. And that's often like really, really fun for for everyone involved. Yeah, we, we I mean, we could probably go on for for hours on this and maybe we could do a future <laughs> how to PR part two or something, you know. Oh, absolutely. There's more to talk about on the marketing front as well. How to market would be another one. Um, there's, you know, we could talk about the role of events in public relations because you can use PR to get events. You can use events to get press. Um, and and you can create <laughs> events that then are cultural moments if you have the the budget and um, intestinal fortitude. Right. You can definitely something that can happen. And we've. Let us know. Hey, read it, listeners, yeah. tell us. Tell us what you want. What do you need most? Absolutely. And we do have some um, downloads, like white papers and things to help you with some of these things. We have one on cultural storytelling for music creation and tech companies. Um, we have one on why AI innov innovators need to speak human, which is a little bit about translating kind of that technical voice into a more um, press-friendly narrative. And then uh, very uh, um, direct, when and how to hire a, a publicity firm. So if you go to rockpaperscissors.biz slash resources, you could download any of our white papers. We'll add more um, as time goes on. But again, that's rockpaperscissors.biz slash resources. All right. This was fun, Dimitri. It's always fun to talk shop with you. I know. We rarely do it on record, so it's kind of cool. The interesting to see. I do want to <laughs> hear from folks uh, what you thought of this episode because we don't, we've been really cautious about promoting ourselves too much in the Music Tectonics brand, but it is part of the How to Start Up series. It's part of the How to Start Up journey. Um, and we certainly hope you got some good value from this regardless. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know we do free monthly online events that you, our lovely podcast listeners, can join? Find out more at musictectonics.com. And while you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference and sign up for our newsletter to get updates. Everything we do explores the seismic shifts that shake up music and technology, the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. That's my favorite platform. Connect with me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it. We'll be back again next week, if not sooner. You're listening to Music Tectonics.